who you are. This is what you want. These now are some ways that you can go get it. There you go, right? And there will be people, that, and the world is full of people who will help you, right? To paraphrase Yates, um, kids do not need pedagogy and content experts to fill their pails. They need motivators to light their fires. And that's what's missing from schools. So there's still a big job there for teachers. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably not something you need full time and it doesn't really need to happen in a classroom, but that leads to the second thing, which is usually called classroom management, but which is really, not to put your finer point on a daycare, okay? Um, and so I wanna close today by imagining a future in which uh, somebody like Andrew Vilinsky goes back to the state Supreme Court and convinces them that they can discover um, that parents have a right to daycare, and that it's the state's responsibility to pay for that. Now, you may be laughing and <laughs> thinking, that's ridiculous, but is it? Given what they've done in the past, it's completely within the scope of things that might happen, right? So let's say that in response to this, every town is required to set up a safe, quiet space with internet access where parents can park their kids while they go out and do their jobs, right? And where the kids can spend that time learning what they want to learn, starting when they want to start, proceeding at their pace, until they can demonstrate whatever level of competence we think is required for them to participate as citizens, right? And then they're done. And then now, basically, here's your, here's your citizenship certificate. Go forth and contribute, right? That actually would be a straightforward, literal implementation of what the Supreme Court insists we ought to be doing. We would be providing each educable child with an opportunity to acquire the knowledge and learning necessary to participate intelligently in the American political, economic, and social systems of free government. We would be doing that directly rather than going indirectly and saying, well, we hope that if we spend a ton of money and build an auditorium and a swimming pool, and maybe if we make them sit in a chair for a thousand hours a year for 12 years, that they'll come out educated at the end, which I think experience has shown really doesn't work. And so here's my question, if we had this, if we had daycare, connected daycare, and you threw in some ex motivational experts on call, so if you got a kid who's bored and he's like, God, I, I don't even know what I should be doing. Great, let's talk to Tony Robbins, okay? And he will get you fired up, and you'll be coming back saying, okay, I need these materials, and here's where I'm trying to go, right? Suppose you had that. Well, here's the question. What would schools add to that? I actually think the answer is nothing, and if the answer is nothing, then maybe this should be the future for schools. But of course, there's a problem. Not everybody is going to be on board with this, right? Um, but you, why wait? Why wait for the court case? Why not do it now? And if you think it's too big a change, why not do it with an experiment? Take some kids and say, we're going to try something different with you. And we're going to give you this kind of space, and we'll give you a little bit of guidance, and we'll see what happens, right? You don't have to do it for everybody. You don't have to make the switch all at once. And it, this would be better for the kids. It would be fairer to taxpayers because you'd actually be really clear about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And they would have a chance to say, yeah, okay, you know what? We can get on board with this. And the only thing standing between this and a school board is a bunch of bullies. So, you know, Gandhi didn't put up with that. Maybe you don't have to either. So, I have two take-home messages, really. The first one is, it's really important not to confuse methods with goals. It's really easy to get tied up and say, well, if I follow these things or I do this activity, it will take me where I want to go. And in fact, it may not. Maybe it can't even possibly do it, right? And so the way I think of this is if your goal is to get kids to the moon, then it's not helpful for you to worry about which, state, which trees the state says they should be climbing because it's not going to get them there, okay? And the second take home message is that once you're clear on your goals and once you know what those are and you're willing to go directly towards them, you have more power and more freedom, more real local control than you think because the state cannot come down on you without killing itself. So that's what I have to say. I hope that was helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Karen. So, Ann, thank you very much. I think you're, you're right on task as far as inspiring children to learn. However, what I think we're missing in all of this, because you see the proficiency at
at the end of third grade, there's an improvement to the end of 11th grade, is that until a child learns to decode their word world and be able to manipulate the um, financial side of things, they can't unlock this world and can't be inspired because they can't read anything. Well, right, and so before they so can read... that has to be the, the fundamental purpose of what we do as educators. Sure, and I agree with you, but I, that's one of the things then early, you know, early on, you're trying to help kids understand why are we doing this? They're, this we're not just doing not this to torture anything, you. Well, but sort of the thing is... If you can't put the letter B with the sound B, to be able to take that uh, butter and decode it, you can't unlock your world, is my point. Right. And if we're not teaching children systematic phonics, they're not learning to do that, which is why our proficiency doesn't improve by the time they get to 11th right. grade. Right, somebody that I worked with at NASA once said we're agreeing violently here. Um, what I'm saying, though, is that if the kid isn't learning to read and doesn't seem to know why he should learn to read, because people will read things to him and people will just tell him stuff, okay, what's his motivation? So little kids can be motivated. I think everybody who has little kids knows that they can be motivated to do things, and sometimes the motivation is indirect and it just gets them going. But motivation is still key. It doesn't matter how old the kid is. If he's old enough to have a conversation with you. He's old enough to actually have you be motivating him. And look, this is the thing you have to... The, the kids I mentioned in Nashville, their parents actually did something that we thought was very interesting. They had a book about how to read and it had a particular system which is actually pretty cool. But their thing was, when you get to the end of this book, you can have anything you want. Now, it's interesting that the kids never asked for something like, I want a swimming pool. It was always like, I want a bike. Or could we go to Funland? Or whatever, right? Because they were young enough that their imagination for what they could get wasn't there. But it was an incredible motivation. It was like, I get whatever I want when I get to the end of it. They couldn't wait to get to that. So even at those ages, you know, four, five, six years old, you can motivate kids to learn what is going to be good for them. And jumping off that and, and notching up a step, there's so much incorrect information. I think it's great to give these kids the laptop and let them have at it, but who's going to be the... Um, who, yeah, who's going to discuss that with them and make sure that they're getting the correct information? Sure, you would hope that parents would do that, but that's not a full-time content presentation job. That's a sitting down with the kid and helping them find, oh, maybe ABC Mouse works for you. Maybe this game works for you. I talked to somebody, somebody mentioned a, a talk I gave that was similar to this, that they had a kid who wasn't learning to read until he ended up going out and making letters in the snow with the other end of a shovel. And it was like, that's what it took, okay? Whatever it's going to take, that's what it takes, and for every kid it's different. But the point is, there is all this information, there are all these, these programs, there's materials. The world is full of them. And so the job then becomes, one, helping them know why they should be doing this, and two, helping them find the right path to get started. Right? There is no one path. I, I think that what you said, it's, it's we need to somehow be teaching parents in our in our public education schools, we need to have classes for parents to know to know how to teach their kids. We can, because teachers aren't handing that over, aren't letting know. And it's like just giving them the grades that their kids are getting is not. What I still say our communities need to be teaching parents. I mean, I'm not certainly against, I'm certainly not against that, and I would note that if you look at any of the things, it doesn't actually say that the, the people who have to be educated to become citizens are kids. It just says people. If you haven't learned some of that stuff, you're still a people. And I don't mean to cut off these questions. I would like them to continue in the third hour. Crop TV.